Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our third Centennial Speaker Series event. Um, I'm the editor in chief, Lawrence Ukendi, and I'm joined by Fallon Roth, our news editor, who will be co moderating this with me. Um, thank you all for coming to our political reporting seminar. I'm super excited to have um, our panelists here. Um, I'm I think we should, or I think I should give them the opportunity to introduce themselves real quick. Um, we have Marsha Cook, Tom Farrick, um, Chris Brennan, um, and Holly um, Otterbein. So if you could just say a little bit about yourselves before we jump into the questions, um, that would be great. Uh, okay, I'll start. Yeah. Uh, I'm Marsha Cook. I'm a senior vice president of global news and special projects at Vice Media Group. I am a a, a long suffering news veteran. I spent 24 and a half years, but who's counting at CBS News, both domestic and international. Uh, I ran our Asia Bureau uh, there for almost eight years based in Beijing and Tokyo. And now I'm based in Brooklyn uh, with uh, Vice and uh, an incredible um, cadre of young journalists that I am uh, enormously proud of. Just won a bunch of Emmys uh, earlier this year and uh, hope that uh, everyone on this call watches Vice News or reads Vice News. So that's me. Oh, and I'm a Temple graduate, proud Temple Owl, 1987, radio, television, and film, drop the mic. Uh, alphabetically, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm not Sarah Mertz, I'm Tom Ferrick. Uh, <laughs> the label to the contrary, I don't know why that is, it's just one of those things. And I am a Temple News uh, graduate, a former Temple, which means I'm not a Temple graduate, um, and, and a former editor back um, during the Franklin Pierce administration. And I've worked in the business for about 40 years, including United Press, and then later for about 31 at the Inquirer. Uh, and that's where I made my career, so to speak. And I have left, I left the Inquirer in 2007 I've done freelance and other assignments, uh, both on the web and in print. And uh, I'm currently looking for any work you might have. <laughs> so I guess I'll go next. Uh, I'm Holly Otterbein. I'm a national political reporter at Politico. Um, I just got back on Monday from maternity leave and I will be covering um, the midterms in 2022 uh, with a focus on progressives and Pennsylvania's Senate and gubernatorial and House races. Um, I covered the Bernie Sanders campaign for Politico um, in 2020. And then uh, during the general election, I covered Pennsylvania in the, in the presidential race. And before that, I worked at a whole bunch of places in Philly, um, most recently, Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, I've also worked for the Daily News, um, WHYY, City Paper, which was a wonderful alt weekly that no longer exists. And I might be missing one um, or two there, but but those are the big ones. Um, and yeah, I, Temple News was a great experience for me. I loved going to Temple, Temple grad, go owls. And I think this is a great panel. I'm excited um, to answer any questions that you might have. So I'm Chris Brennan. I got my start at the Temple News in the previous century. Uh, after that, I wrote for publications uh, in Pennsylvania, in Hawaii, in New Jersey. Uh, then I came back to Philadelphia in 1999, first with the Philadelphia Daily News, then with the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, I cover politics from, you know, ward elections to presidential elections. Uh, and I also uh, sort of quarterback the Friday Clock column, which is a collection of political news as only Pennsylvania can produce it. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here um, this evening. Just a little bit on like the st structure of this. Um, we're gonna take like the first, I'd say 40 minutes to go answer questions from each of the panelists um, or from answer questions, the panelists will answer questions. Um, and then we'll devote maybe like the last 15 to 20 minutes to get questions from the audience as well. Um, but I guess my first question, and we can just go, anyone can jump in to answer this. Um, what was the specific moment where like you decided you'd want to get into political reporting and what spurred that passion for you um, early on before, whether it was at Temple, early in your professional career or otherwise? 
So when I was in Florida, I, I covered crime and courts, uh, and that sort of sparked the interest for me, uh, especially um, the way um, juvenile justice was handled or mishandled at times. Uh, and so the heart of that was um, was uh, um, uh, politically driven. Uh, and so, uh, and then when I came home, the Philadelphia Daily News asked me to be uh, the public transit reporter, and that was all political driven too. So a lot of the things I did, uh, a lot of other beats lead back to politics, and that's what sparked my interest. Yeah, I have a kind of similar. FBI and um, the best place, which is now defunct, but the best place to work at UPI were often the state capitol bureaus. So I started out in Philadelphia and then I was I transferred over to Harrisburg, uh, which is a great uh, beat uh, for UPI people, especially because you can work Monday through Friday. You don't have to work overnight. You don't have to work uh, Saturdays or Sundays. And uh, when I went to Harrisburg, I was assigned to cover the legislature and I was uh, nonplussed. I had no idea what I was doing. And um, I, but after about a year, I sort of began to catch on and I found it fascinating, the legislative process fascinating. But you can't cover the legislative process without realizing that politics is integral to it. And at UPI, I also had the opportunity or the necessity to cover a political campaigns, statewide political campaigns, which I did throughout the 70s into the 80s. And when I went to the Inquirer, I also served as political writer for about five years, uh, which was one of the five or six beats that I had during my time there. I always found it fascinating. Uh, it is seasonal um, in the sense that it's seasonal to your editors. Uh, you get the best play and the most attention in the time leading up to an election. And then it's a little bit like a rock rolling down the hill and it hits a tree. And then suddenly nobody's terribly interested in it. But, uh, but I've always found it to be interesting and I found it very rewarding to cover it. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just talk about how I got involved um, or got interested in politics. So I um, was always interested in being a reporter ever since I was a little kid. You know, me and my brother and sister would make like fake news specials on, um, you know, old school video cameras about how my parents didn't recycle, like illuminating that great investigative journalism in the Otterbein household. Um, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to cover. I think I, I was kind of interested in arts and entertainment. I thought that sounded cool. So that was the track that I took in college um, reporting on that stuff. And then um, once I got my first paid job uh, in journalism was at the city paper, I was the agenda editor, which was basically editing the listings and the events that week, which ended up being a lot of obviously arts and entertainment events. And I found that I would make a lot of the coverage be about politics, even if it weren't about politics. So kind of similar to what Chris was saying, like he found that other beats connected back to politics. Um, I managed to do that even with like arts and entertainment. And so I remember there was this one story um, about this kind of racy group that was like, a, you know, kind of group that only city paper would cover. Um, and they had a annual um, fundraiser where they would actually raise money for a good cause, even though they were kind of this racy, um, organization. And they wanted to raise money for the libraries during the big fight over closing down the libraries under the Nutter era. And the libraries didn't want to take their money. And so I, I remember doing that piece and, and talking about it with um, the editor and, and just kind of realizing like, you know, I, I probably should cover the news and politics. Like this is what I want to do and haven't look back, looked back from there. Um, kind of moving on to, um, I know right now we're discussing a lot about how you guys have gotten started in, in the political reporting world. Um, how has the way the nation has viewed the press kind of changed since, you know, you, you got your start in political reporting um, and, you know, com in comparison to now, kind of just that evolution? Not at all. I'm joking. Uh, uh, the nation has changed a lot in the way it views the press. I think um, 
I, I think that when I started out in the business, the press was something that's not necessarily, and I'm talking to press, newspapers, uh, print media was something that it is not today. And that is ubiquitous and powerful. Uh, and it had the ability to um, change policy and to influence people. And I think that was in direct relationship to its readership. Uh, back in the day when I started with the Enquirer in um, say 2000, 2005, if you uh, ran an ad in two Sunday Enquirers as an advertiser, you would reach something like 90% of the Pennsylvania market, Pennsylvania, New Jersey market. The penetration was amazing. There were 800,000 Sunday circulation, it was 400,000 daily circulation. And as I discovered, as I moved along um, to other online endeavors, that uh, there's a direct ratio between audience and influence. And that um, it's other websites that I created or worked with, we simply didn't have the massive audience to create, uh, to create that kind of response. And I think to a certain degree, we are moving in that direction in the print media today, where you see much smaller circulations at the papers. Uh, and um, so as a consequence, its influence is um, not as great. And so um, that is one of the changes that I have seen. Um, and, but the way people view journalists, reporters and political reporting is in fact roughly the same today as it was. Some people find it total bullshit. Some people find it fascinating. Uh, and some people find it extremely biased. Uh, and that is true now, and that was true 30 years ago. I'm done. I know. Uh, <laughs> you'd think I'd learned by now. Um, you know, I worked for a legacy. I'm not print, uh, I'm broadcast, and I worked for a legacy brand, uh, well known, once called the Tiffany Network. Um, and in its heyday, um, you know, you could reach 20 million people in a single broadcast. Oh my God, right? And then you've just seen that kind of decrease, decrease, decrease. And now you've got several networks uh, that are all vying for the same slice of the pie. Um, now I work in a world of multi-platforms. So the news and politics that we cover can be tweaked and massaged to fit a Snapchat or an Instagram Live or traditional broadcast, um, and then obviously all of our video content. But I remember days where I could go out with a mic and a camera person and people would stop to talk to me. Uh, then I began to have experiences where people would you know, hiss and treat me as if I was the demon seed. So in those ways, um, things have changed. But I will say this, when thinking about um, news and politics and coverage, especially uh, coverage of communities of color, when I, as a black woman, walk into a community that looks and sounds just like me, it is, ah, yes, all right come and talk to me. So that to me is that point where, yes, there's division. Yes, we're polarized, but that is the diversity question that I think we have to really be mindful of and that we need to get more um, journalists of color out there and reporting because I think that makes all the difference in the world when you are reporting on communities of color. Um, and when I started, I was the only one. So that that has changed uh, dramatically, but not enough uh, to make me feel like uh, we're equal in our numbers in newsrooms across this country. Well, Polly, were you gonna say something? I saw you unmuted. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, along the same lines as what everyone else is saying, we're less and less trusted, I think, than before. I think there has been a shift. I, I don't think that we were, you know, as um, mistrusted even just 10 years ago or so, which is when I started getting paid for this. Um, 
I think that it's gotten worse. And then I also think that because of social media, um, not only do people trust us less, but like the people that trust us less are louder and they're able to organize and they're able to spread misinformation in a way that they weren't before. And so, you know, I've had experiences with this where I'll write an article for Politico um, and then some disinformation about it will spread on Twitter. This happened with a piece um, about the Sanders campaign in 2020 and it went viral um and it was just it was basically saying that my article was fake news for this like very specific weird reason that was totally made up and and it went completely viral and you know journalists even left-wing journalists um that i had respected were retweeting it and so you know not only are we distrusted but then on top of that there's like this algorithm that is making people trust us even less um, and it can feel, you know, it can feel like a real um, sort of ocean to deal with. It's, it feels impossible many days to really, um, to change that, unfortunately. Yeah, I would agree that social media, um, <clears throat> which was supposedly created to help us communicate, has actually helped drive us apart. Um, I, I've noticed this uh, lately, um, uh, people on the far left and the far right of the political spectrum, whether in office or running for office, have just stopped responding to media requests for comments, for requests for interviews, uh, and instead put everything that they have to say about themselves and you on Twitter. So, I mean, it actually causes a lack of engagement. Uh, and that trickles down to the readership. And But the thing I've found is that, um, if you can cut all, cut through all that, like I, like like everybody else at the Enquirer, I get these long rambling, angry emails about what a terrible person I am, either because I'm too far to the right or too far to the left. Uh, some days, my favorite days is when I get both. When I'm told that I'm, you know, a far right troll and um, you know, a socialist plant. Um, so, uh, what I do is I call people back and I talk to them about who I really am. Uh, so. Really, the only cure for this is, is direct engagement. Uh, don't flame people on Twitter. I've, I've been there. It doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't make anybody feel better. It doesn't accomplish anything. The best thing you do is call back people back and talk to them. And, you know, like if they're hostile, don't be hostile. Don't take the bait. Just talk about facts. Okay, so I guess given that increased polarization, I guess if there's any, like, one like major or like crucial piece of advice you'd offer to anyone who aspires to political journalism or anyone just starting out, what would that be? Be honest and unsparing. Good advice. Chris, I feel like your solution of calling um, readers directly is just very Philadelphian. Like just, just call them, just call them and talk to them and be straight with them. Um, no, but that, I mean, that's a good piece of advice for dealing with sources too. Like you are going to be dealing with some folks, you know, like Chris said on the far left and far right spectrum, and even in the center who have no interest in talking to you and you kind of just got to badger them, um, and just like, keep calling them and keep calling them. And eventually like, it's going to be easier for them to just pick up your call than to keep ignoring it. <laughs> um, and, and that's what you have to do. It feels embarrassing sometimes, but I think eventually most of the time it works. I'm also a big fan of finding where somebody's going to be and stepping in front of them. Uh, be a real person, be right in front of them, you know, not in like sort of a, an aggressive way, but uh, I'm here, here's your chance to talk to me. And if you walk away from me, I'll write a story about how you walked away from me and my question. Right. I'll add, I think, you know, it's uh, just accentuating what everyone else has said is that you use truth as your your as your frame you know not what politicians or advocates are talking about uh, about objectivity your role is not to adjudicate an argument between two sides but to use you know critical thinking questioning analysts to determine what is true and use that to inform. I still believe, as I know everyone else here does, that we are providing a public service um, and we can never let go of that. Um, so that's my addition. Um, Holly, so, you know, kind of reporting in this 
polarized um, political environment that we have just been discussing, um, you know, I assume that to report on national politics or, you know, the Senate midterms um, and people on both sides of the political spectrum, that you need a trusted list of sources to kind of give you the inside scoop of what is going on, um, party dynamics, political interactions, and things like that. What is the most difficult part of finding a list of trusted sources of people that will be honest with you um, when we're in such a place of political divide? Yeah, so when I was thinking about like how to answer this question, um, you know the like headlines that always say this one weird trick will like solve everything in your life. Um, there is no like one weird trick um, to building sources and getting sources to trust you and, and doing this in this very polarized environment, uh, you know, along the same lines um, of what I was saying before is it just like the hardest thing is that it takes a lot of work. It's just like a day in day out grind. Oops, sorry. My, <laughs> uh, the thing that was lighting up my room just fell off my computer. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm in the dark now. But um, uh, it's also it's also hard to work with tech if you're me, but um, no, I mean it's it's just like making those calls day after day, uh, making cold calls, right? Especially if you're new to a beat, which I was, you know, a few years ago um, when I joined Politico to cover the 2020 election. Um, it's you know even it's touching base with sources that you've had for a long time. It's making sure that you like keep those relationships up and just calling them and asking them, you know, what do you think about this thing that happened? Tell me what you think the state of the race is here. Like just getting any reason for them to talk to you, even if you're not going to write about it um, today or tomorrow um, or have no story planned about it at all. Like you just need to keep working those relationships over and over again, every single day. It's just, it's a lot of just being on the phone, um, honestly. And that can be awkward and it can be scary um, and it can just be a grind. Uh, but that, I think that's the hardest thing is just kind of doing that day in, day out. And, you know, there will be many times when people aren't picking up your calls or like you're just not getting the information that you want and you just have to keep doing it and put your nose to the grindstone. And eventually um, I think the hard work will pay off. Um, and is that kind of one of the of the foundational skills that you learned when you were doing local reporting um, at the Inquirer or Philly Magazine or WHYY? Um, and what some of the other foundational skills did you learn that you brought with you to to more national um, political stories? Yeah, that's absolutely um, something that I learned uh, locally. Like, you can't just email people, right? Um, like, you just you have to make the calls. And I do feel like you know like I was joking with Chris, but like there is something very Philadelphian about like getting on the phone um, and talking to people and just being straight up with them. And so I think that um, carried itself and helped and helped me when I became a reporter at a national outlet. Um, I, I think it's basically the same job reporting um, on national politics as it is local politics. Like it's just, it's a different sort of group of people. Um, but it's the same basic dynamics and you shouldn't let it scare you. Like if you can make the jump from local to national reporting, if that's what you want to do, I was definitely scared doing that, um, and intimidated. And I remember, um, uh, Dave Davies actually, um, the great, uh, WHYY journalist and, and fresh air, uh, contributor co-host. I'm not exactly sure what his title is there. Um, said to me, like, there is no difference between local and national reporting. Like it's the same set of skills and he was totally right. It is. Um, so, you know, you just have to, you have to do the same things. Um, and you have a little bit, you know, bigger of a microphone, but that's about it. Absolutely. Yeah, Chris, one thing I looked at, um, or I've been thinking about um, since I've like, obviously go to school here at Temple in Philly is, um, given your background, I guess, covering politics, specifically Philadelphia politics, is there anything specific that's different about Philadelphia politics than other major cities in the United States? I can't think of too many other places where journalists cover people as they enter the field of politics, run campaigns, get elected, become investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, <laughs> go on federal trial, 
get convicted, go to prison, come home, and talk to you the whole way through. Um, I've, I've, I've got several sources that I talk to that have been through that cycle. Uh, and I, in fact, I just had a long chat with one of them um, this afternoon about another one that passed away not too long ago. Uh, and it's just like, that is such an unusual sort of life experience to, to go through that sort of that, that public scrutiny of campaign and office and investigation and trial. But, you know, it's Philadelphia is the kind of place where they come home and they still talk to you. How would you say is the sort of living, living museum of American politics. Um, we have uh, the vestigial remains of the party organization. In fact, in fact, this is true generally. Um, we live both in the past and the present to a certain degree in the future. Uh, so the party organization, which was of paramount importance 50, 60 years ago, is still out there. It doesn't have the significance that it did because people have found other ways to reach voters and the electorate has changed, but they're still there and they still make demands. And um, you have to realize that, that you, have to, you have to put their, them and what they do in context. Um, their influence on elections is in inverse ratio of the visibility of the election. If it's an invisible election, like for judge, they can still be influential. If it's for mayor or president, almost zero. But they have to be tended to, and they, they generally want to be heard. Uh, they're not necessarily filled with insight. Uh, one of the things that you have to watch when you're on a beat, and this isn't politics, but on any beat, is you have sources who would be perfectly willing to determine your agenda of stories, what you'd write, how you'd write it, when you'd write it, what you'd say. They wanna play you, I guess, is the other way. And we see that in political campaigns for those of us who've covered them by talking to campaign managers and other spinners, for want of a better word, who will always be trying to sell us their point of view, no matter how uh, unlikely it is. And we're used to all the usual lines in that. So it takes a while, I think. It takes experience to be able to sort through all that what static and find what's mostly serious. Uh, I have had people say to me, for instance, um, I will tell you what's going on, but you can't print it. And I would say, well, I don't wanna hear it because if I can't print it, what difference does it make? I mean, I know about it, but that, that's usually they just wanna give you an inside reason or excuse for what they're doing. But I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in covering your campaign and the public manifestations of it. I generally speaking am not that interested in inside stuff. I'm interested in how the campaign portrays itself and whether or not it reaches people. And there are certain um, basic barometers for that. One of them is money, their capacity to raise money uh, and their, their handling of paid media. Uh, and those are two important factors uh, these days in almost every race, you have to have a good amount of money. And so as a consequence, as a reporter, as a political reporter for years, I've paid a lot of attention to the money, where they're getting it, how much they're raising it, how they're spending it. That's sort of the inside of what's going on in a campaign that manifests itself on the outside. So you do have to pay attention to some of the moving parts uh, in a campaign, but it's not, uh, it's not as detailed as you think it might be, and you might, might, you might imagine it would be. Because really a campaign, a campaign exists for the public. It is a public endeavor. And so you have to judge them on how they're doing with the public. Uh, not how they're doing inside, not how their advisors are doing, not what their people say, how clever they are, but how people actually react to them and how, how sensible their message is and whether it's getting through. So it's all sorts of common sense that you need uh, to cover a political campaign. But I will warn you that you will be, um, you'll be spun. You'll, there'll, there'll be people who tell you that blue is red and that up is down and that the mood is made out of green cheese or blue cheese. And, um, and they will say it with great sincerity and you'll almost at times believe them. 
Um, Tom, kind of on the, the topic of campaigns, um, in about two weeks, there's going to be the, the state and municipal elections in Philly. Um, as someone who has covered local politics, what power, um, if any, does local political journalism have encouraging voter turnout and civic engagement in local elections and politics that don't get a lot of voter attention um, or, or voter turnout in general? Um, minimal. I think uh, we, we really don't, we can't, I, I mean, I think if we find out if someone has done something that's wrong or particularly stupid and we write about that, that could have an effect on a campaign. But, uh, but the basic tectonics of a campaign, turnout, who's gonna show up and stuff, are sort of fixed in advance. And the reality is, is there's, very, there's not much interest in local politics among local voters. I mean, we had a mayor's race, what was it? What was the turnout last time? I mean, like 23% of the registered voters showed up for that race and, and that's pretty bad. Only in presidential races do we get up to the 70% mark. So a lot of races, it's, it's fewer than a majority of the voters, let alone the majority of people who live in the city who are eligible. I don't know why that is. It may have something to do with the fact that we're an urban area and it's somewhat impersonal that you get to smaller towns and you end up knowing the politician who's running. Mm -hmm. It may just be that uh, the political party only can to um, only moves between A and C or A and D that there's really not enough or that much of a difference. I think that's changed in Philadelphia with the emergence of the progressive wing of the party. But um, it's really tough to get people interested. I, I, and I certainly, I certainly can't pretend that I can do it. <clears throat> I guess given um, the increased polarization, I guess nationwide, um, Chris, how would you say that, how would you say that you've observed your reporting in Philadelphia change throughout your career as things have become more polarized? I don't think my reporting's really changed much. I think the reaction to my reporting has changed. Um, there was always uh, an element of the readership who um, brought a bias to their readership that they then transposed onto the person creating the journalism. So if you have a bias against journalists, if you believe the journalists are bad for some reason, when you read a journalist, you impose that bias onto the journalist. And so then the journalist is bad in your mind. And this is some of the things I talk about with people um, that, you know, there's this, um, there's this thing where people project bias. Uh, and so one of the reasons I call people is because I say, look, you know, you're, you're telling me that um, you think I'm wrong for this reason, or you think I'm pointed in the wrong reason for this direction. Explain to me exactly what in the story gave you that. I ask people to like put the story in front of them and tell the, tell me, where they think I went wrong. And if you like drill down into it, and this is both on the left and on the right, because uh, I hear from both sides, um, the argument starts to falter. And then, then I talk to people about how it's natural to sort of have a bias. It's natural for them to assume that, you know, I, I am exactly the bad you know, journalist that they, their, their bias suggests. And that's, you know, and then you talk about, you know, how maybe they're off on that. You know, like I, I hear from Republicans who think, you know, I take it easy on Democrats. And then I, you know, I ask them if they read some of my stories about Democrats that the Democrats really didn't enjoy it. And, you know, and, you know, that gets through. Uh, and same thing happens with um, uh, if Democrats think that I'm too friendly with Republicans, I, you know. Point to plenty of things I've written that Republicans didn't enjoy either. If everybody's mad at me, I'm doing it right. On that note, um, Marsha, being where you are in Vice Media, I guess, how does polarization affect the work that you do and how your journalists ultimately go about their job um, in this environment? Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't know if it changes the way we go about how we report um, day in and day out. I think that perhaps maybe there are um, instances where if we're doing a 
piece as we've just done, I'm just gonna pull it up because it's important that I get the title right. But we we're doing a, a deep dive right now in elections and misinformation. And we, even though um, we're a youth media organization, um, our correspondents and writers get trolled uh, by everyone that the politicos and the inquirers get trolled by as well. Um, I think what's a little bit different for us is because so much of our staff is younger, um, there are things that I as management try to put in place to help them when those instances seem to just kind of crash down on them when they're being uh, harassed online. But, you know, I think that we speak in a very authentic voice, um, just as my esteemed colleagues do as well. Um, we try to cover, you know, political stories that we know resonate with our audience. So right now we're doing lots of deep dives around voting rights and reproductive rights, because that's what we know our audience is interested in. But I think that, you know, we're just trying like everyone else to um, regain trust or to continue uh, continue to have our audience trust the work that we do. Um, the fact that that's really not changed uh, over a lifetime, that we're still uh, suspect as journalists, but now it's even more fractured um, is a challenge. But I think, you know, for us, the challenge is what are the stories that we know our audience will relate to and, and what are the stories that resonate for them? The polarization is really difficult, but as I said earlier, it's about facts and addressing what we know to be uh, the truth. We just had a fabulous brainstorm this morning, my God, what time is it, around how do we, uh, we did a survey about climate that will drop very soon in time for COP26 in Scotland. And one of the questions addressed how people perceive facts and that they'd like us as journalists to put some sort of you know disclaimer at the top of the story saying everything you're about to read is factual uh, <laughs> well of course it is <laughs> so you know having those kinds of discussions we would have never had previously i mean that's journalism it's what we do but now that we know our audience is constantly questioning our reporting um, what can we do much the same way when we put up a story about how uh, uh, individuals who uh, have worked in polling stations uh, have been harassed um, and we have their unedited uh, conversations with us that contained quite a few curse words at the top of the show. We leave those in because that's an authentic voice. You know, legal practice, the standards and practices didn't like us last night for that, but we got it in, that's our authentic voice. It's the same way we would put up before graphic content like our stories out of Kabul. Um, know that this is coming at you. Turn away if you don't want to see it. Um, so what am I talking about? I think it's just trying to, at this very difficult time in our society, to give as much information as we can to the public. And if they push back to our audience, if they push back, so be it. But we just have to keep doing it. Um, we can't, we can't um, step away from what is our responsibility as journalists. So don't know if I answered the question, but there you have it. Yeah, and I guess along that note, um, what would you say that your chief goal or priority has been since obtaining a leadership role at Vice Media? And what kind of like legacy or impact do you want to leave? What? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Um, legacy. Jesus. Um, the goal is to continue what we're doing. Um, unfiltered. Um, 
reporting on the stories that we think the others are not. That if we can continue to do that as a news organization, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, sure, I'd like to find ways to have our journalism supported more, that we're not constantly um, thinking about finances. Um, I'd love it if we could just focus on news gathering and not worry about all of that stuff, but that's, that's life today, isn't it, kids? Um, but uh, for me, a legacy would be that um, I, in maybe in some way, was responsible for bringing in a new generation of correspondents uh, that, that look like me and you and Fallon, that we have um, diverse newsrooms, both uh, ethnically and, and gender wise, um, that I think I've done some good work in that department. I've even hired a former Temple graduate or a Temple graduate, a former Temple news person. Uh, so that makes me pretty happy. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about legacy, it's too soon. Now that um, Lawrence and I have ad had our chance to ask questions um, of our four panelists here, we're going to open up the floor to questions that our audience members may have. Um, you can raise your hand or, or put a question in the chat and we'll go from there. Uh, Don, it looks like you have a question. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to the best of us. <laughs> Uh, my question is for Marsha. What you said early on really resonated about people of color covering and doing reporting in the neighborhoods that so that when people come up, they, they see someone that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. So what I wonder, and just looking at, at the screen in front of me, uh, we, with everybody's camera off, I can't really tell, but we don't have a lot of people of color on this, this screen. What do you think that we can do at Temple to encourage more students to pursue the types of careers uh, that you have as well as the other people here, but specifically uh, people of color? Is there a way that we could incorporate that into our instruction? Um, and this is in addition to, you know, good old fashioned recruiting and having more people like me talk to students so that they can see that there are uh, most especially women in executive positions so they know that it can be attained. Um, I think that, um, understanding that the traditional ways of news gathering constantly keep evolving. So uh, being able to speak the language and understand that as much as I respect and love and I still get print, like I can read online, but why would I do that when I can get my fingers dirty and leave imprints all over my apartment with the newspaper? I love that, um, but I'm a dying breed. But the fact that it's important for an institution like Temple and, and many other journalism uh, uh, colleges to understand that, you know, there are all these different formats uh, and uh, different platforms and being inventive and being of the moment and understanding that there are different ways. I mean, I get kind of freaked out when I hear everyone saying that they want to be a narrative storyteller and I'm like, okay, so do you know how to write? Um, so, because it's like, well, I'll just do podcasts. It's like, well, there's a little bit more than just saying you want to do podcasts. Uh, I have a feeling that Chris might want to say something there. Um, or at least I thought he wanted to. Um, but I do think that understanding- I just really want to do a podcast. Okay. <laughs> but I think understanding the different platforms and, uh, changing curriculum at, at, outside of learning the traditional basics of what it means to be a journalist, but also understanding like the evolution of our school moving from radio, television and film to the Lou Klein School of Media and knowing that there are so many different ways to express uh, what it is that you might want to do within the journalism arena is super important. But I'll say again, 
the more that you can uh, harness the superpowers of people that look and sound like me to come in and talk to students so that they know that we were there. Um, it's not just, oh, can I call her and will she give me a job? It's no, which always happens. Um, it's more about understanding what it means to work in this field and how to get that job and mentorship, 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 I think is enormously important. I don't know if I answered your question, um, but I tried. I, you did, Marsh. I think you touched on it, and I hope the faculty members in the journalism department will take that back to their department, because I do believe that we bring people into the program. My concern is, are they not going out of the program into the field where you are? Um, Steve, I think your hand was raised next. Hi, thanks. Um, Temple News, 1970-something. Um, I'm an instructor now at Temple, and one of the things that uh, I, I wonder about, um, you know, in the latter part of my news management career, I felt um, sort of this uh, generation of politeness that was annoying the heck out of me, uh, where I felt like uh, I was sort of pushing reporters to do things that they weren't you know necessarily comfortable or even had thought to do like i didn't even know what a FOIA request was you know until five years ago uh you know things that uh people are supposed to give up because they are public domain court records etc that you know reporters either didn't ask for or uh were afraid to push too hard um am i wrong about that are we doing enough to kind of make them comfortable with being that person I've never had a problem with pushing too hard. And I used to sit next to Holly and I could tell you, she had a problem with pushing too hard, way too hard. I mean, you should have heard her harangue people on the telephone. It was horrible. Um, but but uh, no, I think, um, I will tell you that the young journalists who come into the Inquirer now come ready to play ball. Um, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, we've got people in their twenties who are not soft at all. They come, they, they know what they're looking for, and they're not as, um, afraid to knock on doors and, and get the information. Can I mention something um, in passing? I don't, in some of these panels, it becomes inevitable that we make the profession or what we do sound like the stages of the cross. You know, like it's a great burden and that we are, we are suffering constantly from people pressing at us and and people calling us names and et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is I got into this business and stayed in it <clears throat> because it was fun. Uh, it is fun to do political reporting. It is fun to, I mean, I find it fun, for instance, to dig into records and dig into um, campaign reports and withdraw uh, analysis or salient facts from it. I like being at debates. I like uh, covering politicians. Uh, because they can do all sorts of wonderful and strange things. And it is just fun to be a reporter. And uh, it, it's different today than it was uh, back during the Pierce administration. And I think, but, but not so much, because when I started in the business, I started at United Press. And the, and the motto there was a deadline every minute. Now, I, I sort of think we're back to that with the kind of demands that the media put on us, or put on people who are practitioners today, to get it out, to get it up, and then to come back and do more later and to do more later, I think we're juggling a heck of a lot. But I just think that being a reporter is fun. I mean, it's fun and it's rewarding. And I don't know if we would have stayed in the business for so long if it made us miserable or if we felt the, the oppressive weight of uh, trolls and, and others who, are, uh, who think that we're shits. Just, just my point of view. It's fun to complain, though, too, Tom. You have to admit. Well, that is true. But... <laughs> Always be wary of, of a reporter who isn't complaining. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. No, I, I. That's part of the fun. Complaining about how hard we work and how we're misunderstood. But Tom, I mean, you've got it right. I've worked as a roofer. I've worked as a landscaper. This beats working for a living. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and also, there's sort of a, and you can testify to this, Holly. There's sort of a a rush you get uh, in covering a campaign. 
because it has a certain speed to it. It has a certain rhythm to it that that just gradually speeds up as the um, as the destination day uh, comes, and uh, the people in it are usually hyper about about what they're engaged in, mm -hmm. and so they're interested. They're interested in their their their, and the candidates are interesting, and um, yeah, sometimes. I, well, you're right. There have been a few that you know. I covered Steve room just to leave it. But, uh, but they're not always interesting, I agree. But I can make them interesting. But, and, the, and the ones that aren't interesting are sometimes interesting in how uninteresting they are. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. Right, I, that was my experience with covering Steve Forbes. So yeah. incredibly dull, uh, but was a legit candidate for a period of time. And I had to kind of find a way to make him interesting, even though he knew that he had a plane that had the Simpsons on it. And every reporter tried to get that shot of him standing in front of the Homer Simpson image. And he literally would run up the steps of the plane to avoid yeah. that shot of him next to Homer. But it was fun. Um, well, he was trying to have a humor implant and they usually don't work. Yeah. <laughs> you right. know, they just don't. I mean, I covered Arnold Specter and he was pretty humorless uh, and somewhat feral. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, you know, so that's okay, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you get into that. Plus you get people who really get angry at you like campaign people or candidates themselves and will chew you out, um, um, which really scared the hell out of me when the first first five or six times people did it to me. And then I sort of got used to it. And then, you know, I just had sort of this- uh, If Ed Rundell hasn't sh shook his fist in your face, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Well, I try to be charming. Uh, moving on to, to Frank's question. And then afterwards, we have a question in the chat from someone. Uh, thank you, Fallon. Uh, just, I'm a, a Temple grad, obviously. And I didn't work for Temple News because I had a, a, a job as a stringer for uh, today's post in Montgomery Publishing out in Montgomery County when, while I was in school. And uh, and I eventually became their uh, political writer in, in Montgomery County, so I'm not uh, uh, unknown to, to, to politics. And then I event, eventually evolved into the other side of the uh, table as a, a communications director for uh, 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 government and and uh, and candidates and and elected officials. And I've I've spoken with Holly and Chris and and Tom over the years. Um, one of the most incredible evenings I had was at a, a Democratic fundraiser when Ed Rendell walked into the room all disheveled an hour late and and he was all upset about uh, the budget negotiations going on in Harrisburg and he said he said to this room of, of Democrats if they would just let me and John Purzell make all the decisions everything would be okay and you know so that lets me that, that leads me to my question which is, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, there was a, a, a at least some uh, bipartisanship, and there is not now. We all know that. What what differences in in, in, in you know you used to cover the art of the deal. Now it's like you're covering a war. I mean, how does that affect how you you deal with your contacts and and uh, and things like that? If that makes any sense. Yeah. So I covered some of those Rendell budgets, uh, and I remember, I remember John Brazell sometimes working with them. I remember John Brazell sometimes sandbagging at Rendell on the, the budget stuff. But I, I do think that um, you know, I mean, the the current governor and the Repub is a Democrat, and there's a Republican control General Assembly, and they do sort of spit out a state budget every year, and they do make some deals. Um, Tom Wolf, the current governor, is not exactly a practitioner of the political arts. Uh, he's more like a professor of political science who doesn't understand why the students don't get what he's trying to teach them uh, when the students are elected officials who don't care what he's trying to teach them. Um, so it's... Uh, 
you know, it'd be interesting um, to see who the next governor is, uh, the way things are going. I think the Republicans are going to maintain control of the General Assembly for a while longer. Uh, and so if w the next Democrat might come in with a better handle on how to um, negotiate across the aisle or a Republican will come. I, I mean, we have seen in Pennsylvania Republicans who, have, as governor, have had trouble getting along with Republican General Assemblies. So I think... I think every iteration of the government is sort of like a new try, you know, you know, even though a lot of the same faces come back, you know, we'll get a new Senate, we'll get a new house, we'll get a new governor and everybody gets another, you know, it's kind of like a baseball game. Everybody gets a fresh inning. Yeah, I cover campaigns, you know, more than government. Um, and I think the thing that I've noticed is that as we get further and further away from sort of the glory glorified days of yore when, you know, there was bipartisanship. Voters seem to crave it more. Um, I mean, you know, Joe Biden ran on being a deal maker, right? On being a creature of the Senate who could reach across the aisle and work with Republicans. He consistently like had that message during the campaign, which was in great opposition to other presidential candidates in the Democratic primary who, you know, promised to be, you know, more of those war makers. Um, you had Donald Trump, right? Who you referenced the art of the deal. Like he, he promised to make deals, um, deals, deals, deals. So I, you know, I think it's fascinating that like campaigns are still appealing to these sort of nostalgic days in which politicians were able to cut deals. Um, you know, the more that it, it seems um, it's difficult to do so. On the other hand, like Chris said, like Every uh, legislative session is another chance to do this. And, and Biden right now is facing this test of whether or not he's going to be able to pass, um, you know, bipartisan infrastructure deal as well as uh, his Build Back Better agenda. There goes my light again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I tried <laughs> with some tape and it fell. <laughs> um, now moving on to a question that we have in the chat from Robert Simmons. Um, I'll just read it out um, for everyone. Uh, so Robert says, when I left PA after Temple, I realized the state had an above average percentage of politicians who went to prison. New Jersey is no bargain either. Do those who cover covered other parts of the country share this perception? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I talk to journalists from around the country, when they ask me where I'm from, I tell them. And when I they ask me what I cover, I tell them. They usually react with some sort of, oh boy. Uh, and we were just talking about John Prezel. He was one of those guys. He went from Mater D at a restaurant in the Northeast to state representative, to speaker of the house, to state prison. Uh, and now he's back and he's uh, you know back in the Northeast and he's still pulling political moves. Um, but yeah, I, I do think, uh, you know, if I go to like a, uh, 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 investigative reporters and editors conference um, somewhere else in the country uh, and people find out where I'm from and what I do, they expect me to have some crazy stories. You really excel at that. Um, and it's something we should be proud of um, uh, because um, um, it makes it much more interesting. If everybody was a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, uh, it would not be much fun to cover politics. Uh, there's a lot of really sincere people in politics and um, they tend to be very boring people. But, uh, but we've had, a, our scoundrels are interesting at least, right. whether it be Buddy C. and Franny or Vince Fumo. Uh, I mean, Michael Myers for that matter, uh, Ozzy. Uh, they're, 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 all, um, they're all pretty interesting people. They're interesting characters. They're corrupt. To a certain degree, but they're but they're interesting. Ozzy's under indictment again. Yeah, I mean, talk about uh, money talks and bullshit walks. Uh, is he under indictment? Did they indict him? He's currently under indictment again. Wow. Ozzy Myers of Abscan fame. Yeah. Uh, currently facing a federal indictment by uh, on, on, election, election rigging. Kind of, uh, it was a, a ballot stuffing yeah. scam, alleged ballot stuffing scam in South Philadelphia. In a judicial race. And yet I talked to Ozzy, you know, no more than two elections ago. We had a great nice conversation 
He was, you know, the thing about them is you, I think it's true of John Purcell and others, you, be, you achieve a position of power, you're indicted, you're convicted, you go to prison, and then you become a consultant. Um, <laughs> And I think uh, Purcell, I think Ozzie was certainly was a consultant to judicial candidates, which, um, which was important to them because otherwise they'd get totally fleeced by ward leaders who demanded a lot of money and didn't deliver a thing. So they're like um, Virgil in the, uh, in the inferno. They sort of guide the candidates through the different layers of ward leader hell so that they invest their money fairly wisely and don't get totally taken. Uh, and those are, they, they play an important position. It's not, it's not a glamorous position. It skirts on the edge of the law sometimes, but it's something that's really necessary. That's the sort of mechanics of politics that you have to be aware of when you cover these low visibility races like judgeship races. Well, if you talk to Ozzy, tell him to give me a call. The last time I called him, uh, it was about, uh, it was to ask him about being under federal investigation, and he started pretending like he spoke a different language. <laughs> really? Yes. Maybe it was his version of English. No, no, I've heard his version of English. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I don't think he wanted to answer you, Chris. That's correct. <laughs> On that note, um, that's all of our questions. Thank you all so much for um, your questions for the panelists, and thank all of you for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure, honestly, to celebrate the Temple News 100th anniversary with this, you know, event and many other events we've done throughout the year so far. So um, thank you all for attending. Um, for any more information on any additional panels or events we're doing, feel free to check the Temple News website. But um, thanks again to all our panelists for joining us tonight. This was awesome. Thanks, thanks for having us. Thank, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.